dear students let us discuss one more module in image based questions in joint surgery so this is module number 3 and we are going to see the case scenarios in gi hemorrhage not only the upper gi both upper and lower gi hemorrhage we are going to discuss so before going to the case scenarios let me define some terminologies in this j hemorrhage what do you mean by upper j hemorrhage it is the hemorrhage proximal to dj flexure that includes esophagus stomach and duodenum that is what is called upper j hemorrhage so two terminologies you should know in upper j hemorrhage that is hematemesis and melanemesis hematemesis is vomiting of bright red blood while melanemesis is vomiting out coffee ground vomitus or <coughs> slightly altered color vomitus okay what is lower j hemorrhage the hemorrhage which occurs distal to the dj flexor that includes small bubble large bubble and anal canal so here also you should know two terminologies hematochesia and melina hematochesia is nothing but bright red blood per rectum or bleeding pr it's called melina is passing tarry blockless stool which is sticky and foul smelling so these are the ter four terminologies you must know and another terminology you must know is what is transit time this is the time taken for the blood to reach anal verge from the site of the bleeding so it is not the site of the bleeding but the rate of the bleeding is important because the the lower j the commonest cause for lower j bleeding is upper j bleed that's why we will be discussing all those things uh, later so transit time is very important and just because bleeding is happening in the upper j uh, site that doesn't mean it cannot produce hematochesia or melina the commonest cause for lower j hemorrhage is bleeding from duodenal ulcer so this you have to keep it in mind because if the bleeding is very rapid if transit time is rapid okay this will present as lower gi hemorrhage even though if it is a bleeding duodenal ulcer so what are the different causes of gi hemorrhage so this here you are seeing the causes for upper gi hemorrhage the causes in esophagus or esophagitis uh, esophageal carcinoma esophageal varices and mallory vestal the causes in stomach or gastric ulcer gastritis and gastric neoplasm that is gastric cancer yeah carcinoma of the stomach causes in the duodenum duodenal ulcer and duodenitis there are some rare causes for upper gi bleeding that is angiodysplasia the angiodysplasia in in the stomach is called dialophilism and hemat hemobilia or hematobilia uh, and melic marginal ulcer yeah all these things are rare causes of uh, upper gi bleed so coming to the causes for lower gi bleed okay i told you already the most common cause for lower gi bleed is upper gi bleed okay causes in the small bowel again vascular malformation that is angiodysplasia meckel's diverticulum neoplasm normally it is non hodgkin's lymphoma inflammatory bowel disease that is crans disease ischemic mesenteric vascular ischemia uh, and neoplasm is that is malignant neoplasm causes in the large bowel rectum and anus it could be again angiodysplasia and diverticulosis both angiodysplasia and diverticulosis will produce massive bleeding hemorrhoids fissure in ano polyps anywhere in the large bowel uh, neoplasm most of the neoplasms are malignant one that is colorectal cancer ischemic colitis and then inflammatory bowel disease so this is case number 1 65 years old chronic alcoholic male patient was brought to the hospital for three three bouts of massive bright red blood vomiting patient had dizziness also there is no history of similar previous episode and he was not taking any nsaids or blood thinning drugs whenever you are dealing with any bleeding whether it is upper gi bleed lower gi bleed or even hematuria you have to ask this history whether 
patient is taking taking any blood thinning drugs that means when the patient is taking any antiplatelets aspirin or oral anticoagulant drugs or history of uh, i mean uh, taking any heparin for all these things you have to ask this is what is called blood thinning drugs on examination bp is only 90 by 60 patient is pale and is also having mild rictus so this is the uh, i mean the case scenario he is a known chronic alcoholic number 1 massive bleeding bright red bleeding hematomas is massive hematom patient is also having dizziness that means massive blood blood loss he is not taking any nsi or blood thinning drugs bp is he is definitely hypotensive okay and this is the upper gi scopy upper gi scopy is clearly showing dilated uh, vein in the esophagus this is what is called esophageal varices so this is a case of esophageal varices because of portal hypertension okay this uh, uh, this esophageal varices uh, is graded into four grades first grade grade 1 there will be just i mean dilatation of the vein but the vein won't get protruded in the lumen of the esophagus that is grade 1 grade 2 okay this will get protruded in the lumen of the esophagus that is grade 2 you can see the protrusion into the lumen grade 3 okay you are seeing even more dilated vein but in between the dilated veins you can see the normal esophageal mucosa that's what you are seeing this is normal esophageal mucosa you can see in between grade 4 okay all you can see the whole circumference you can see only the dilated veins you cannot see in between the dilated veins the normal esophageal mucosa that is grade 4 so the second picture what you are seeing here this is a endoscopic procedure you are seeing a endoscopic banding this is what you are seeing here okay so how will you manage this patient in ane so when you are dealing with this sort of patients in ane you have to look for your a b c d e airway bleeding circulation all those things you have to look make sure that your patient is alive and then you have to stabilize the patient this patient is hypotensive so immediately the first thing you have to do it do, do is you have to start two uh, peripheral white bore iv line and you have to rush in fluid nowadays previously it was 3 to 4 liters now nowadays you have to rush in at least 1 1 and 1/2 liters of either ringer's lactate or normal saline you have to rush in and look whether the bp is picking up or patient is having enough uh, urine output that is what you have to do you have to resuscitate the patient only after stabilizing the patient okay you have to do the upper gi endoscope you shouldn't mobilize the patient for endoscopy if the patient is not hemodynamically stable that, that you have to keep it in mind so uh, uh, what investigation is being done in figure 1 and the findings this i have i have told you already what you are seeing in figure 2 this also i told you already what are the natural photosystemic signs you are seeing Uh, the, this diagram here you are seeing the, the photo natural photosystemic sun will take place in the esophagus that is esophageal varices over the bare area of the liver over the umbilicus caput medusa retro peritoneal area and the hemorrhoids the superior hemorrhoidal or vein yeah, these are the five areas where the natural photosystemic sun will take place okay <coughs> what tube is shown in figure 4 and its use this this is a four luminal tube this is mini sota tube if it is tri luminal tube then that is called sings taken blackmore tube so this tube what this is only for using to temporarily arrest the bleeding so first what you have to do after stabilizing the patient you have to do an upper gi endoscope so, okay after that you have to give if you now you will be knowing the uh, diagnosis it is esophageal varices so immediately you have to start octrotide and triliparsin if that that is unable to stop the bleeding this uh, pharmacological treatment then you have to go for this endoscopic treatment try to do an endoscopy either you can do a banding or injection solution nowadays we are not doing 
injection sclerotherapy, we are doing only this banding, banding of esophageal varices. Okay, even after doing this banding, if bleeding is uh, not controlled, then you have to decide some other procedure, but before going to that procedure, you have to temporarily arrest the bleeding by using this sense taken black mark tube or Minnesota tube. So this is this this has two balloons. This is gastric balloon, this is esophageal balloon. You have to distend the gastric balloon with some uh, radio opaque material like gastrographin, 250 ml. You have to put, pull it, it won't come out of the stomach. So that will compress the GE junction. The, uh, <coughs> So that the uh, blood vessels in the, uh, I mean the esophagus will be compressed, bleeding will stop. Then you have to inflate the esophageal balloon also. At most you can keep this tube in the esophagus for only 48 hours, not more than that. So even in between you can deflate and then in, don't keep it continuously inflated. You can deflate for some time and then maybe for half an hour and then you can uh, inflate and keep it there. Yeah. This is only for, you can use it only for 24 to 48 hours. After that, okay, this is the procedure you have to do. This is what is called TIPS or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic scent. See, this is the portal vein and this is the hepatic vein. So you have to put a uh, shunt, I mean, in between these two veins. So blood from the portal vein, because portal hypertension will go to the hepatic vein. Okay, this is what you have to do. This is called TIPS. But this procedure is uh, usually done by interventional radiologists, not by uh, vascular surgeon, but they have to inform the vascular surgeon. Is if any catastrophe happen during this procedure, okay, the surgeon should intervene. Okay, this is also not a permanent solution for this. Okay, it may be patterned, this sun may be patterned for one or two years only. After that, this also will get thrombos. So, another, uh, this surgery previously we were doing portocaval anastomosis. But portocaval anastomosis, the whole portal blood will bypass the liver and all the uh, toxic metabolites will go to the, uh, I mean, directly to the brain. Okay, all the ammonia and all will produce hepatic encephalopathy. So nowadays, we are not doing portocaval anastomosis, but we are doing selective decompression. Here, they are decompressing the splenic vein. This is splenic vein. You have to join it with left renal vein. This is called splenorenal uh, shunt or Warren shunt. Or another selective shunt is mesocaval shunt. That also you can do where not all the portal blood will, will be bypassing the uh, liver. Some of the blood will go through the portal vein into the liver and it, it will get detoxified. So that is what we were doing. But this also is not a uh, final solution. If, uh, if patient is having cirrhotic liver, the only answer is you have to go for uh, liver transplant. But already the patient is very sick because of these problems. They may not withstand, yeah, uh, I mean, the hepatic transplant. So these are the answers I have given. You have, you can go through this. And I have given the reference also from the Bailey and which pages you have to read for this particular case. So coming to the case number two, this is a 58-year-old man present to the a &E following several episodes of coffee ground emesis. While awaiting evaluation, he suddenly vomits large volume of bright red blood. As he is urgently transported to the resuscitation bay, his wife explains that he is generally healthy except for a stomach ulcer he had the previous year. He has never had an operation and takes no other medications. On examination, patient is distressed but oriented. Pulse rate is 115. BP is 100 by 70 millimeters of mercury. Mild epigastric tenderness is there. Okay. So because it is a case of coffee ground vomitus, okay, you have to do an apogee endoscope and this is what you are seeing here. This is an another patient. So if you are seeing something like this, this is stomach. 
So you are seeing a blood clot there. So you will be asked what forest staging it is. So this is diagnosis bleeding gastric ulcer. Upper GI endoscope they have done. Okay, here you are seeing this is a spurter. This is grade or type 1A. If it is oozing, that is 1B. 2A, you can see visible vessel there. 2B, adherent clot. Our patient is 2B only because we are seeing a big clot over there. 2C, you can see the block spot there over the ulcer area. And grade 3, you can see a clean base. So this is what is called forest classification of peptic ulcer bleeding. Okay, here this is, uh, this is 1A because you are seeing a spurter. One of the gastric ulcer is, you are seeing a spurter here. Whereas in this film, you are, you are seeing only mucosal erosion all over the antrum here. Probably this is because of enazide intake. So this is what is called erosive gastritis. This will occur throughout the whole of the stomach will get eroded because of enazide intake. Okay. And here in this picture, you are seeing the Johnson's classification of peptic ulcer disease. This is type 1, where you are seeing the ulcer in the lesser curvature at the incisura angularis. This is type 2, where you are seeing an ulcer in the lesser curve as well as an ulcer in the duodenum. Type 3, you are seeing a prepyloric or antral ulcer. Type 4, you are seeing the ulcer near the cardiac end of the stomach. And type 5, this is nothing but the antra, I mean the uh, mucosal erosion, yeah, erosive gastritis, that, uh, because of intake of enzymes. Okay, if patient is having bleeding, okay, this is what you are seeing here. You can arrest it by many methods. You can inject adrenaline, you can inject sclerosins to stop these bleedings. Or you can use, here in this picture, you are seeing some laser-like, this is what is called Argon plasma coagulator. This you have to sow in the bleeding area, the bleeding will stop. Or you can even use heat up rope, even hemoclip. All these things you can use to stop the bleeding. Yeah, if, if bleeding cannot be stopped, even by this measure, all these endoscopic measures, eventually, you know, what you have to open the abdomen, okay, open if it is a gastric ulcer bleeding, okay, you open the stomach. And the, the, the two arteries involved in gastric ulcer bleeding is left gastric artery or splenic artery. You have to underrun, suture ligate those bleeding arteries, the bleeding will stop. Yeah, if the patient is young and very stable, in very rarely you can do, okay, partial gastrectomy and you can do Bilrath 1, that is gastroduodenostomy, you can do. But... We are not routinely doing this surgery nowadays because we have got excellent medication for peptic ulcer disease. We are not doing surgery for just because, but if bleeding is not stopped, no, then you can do. If, if you are unable to stop by any means, then you can uh, resort to surgery. So this is also, okay, you can, you can, whatever I have discussed so far, no, it is all there in the answer. You please go through it because this uh, PowerPoint or the PDF file will be sad to all of you. Please read all these things just before your exams. Case number three, a 70-year-old male, male with a history of coronary artery disease on aspirin and uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, present to the emergency room with sudden onset of hematemesis and melina. On examination, on admission, patient is tachycardic, hypotensive, Demonstrate a soft and non-tender abdomen. Rectal exam shows dark stool that is GIAC positive. GIAC positive means fecal occult blood test is positive. This is the upper GI endoscope where you are seeing a blood vessel is exposed. So this is, what is the stage? This is 2A because you are seeing a blood vessel there. And this is of course 1A because you are seeing a spurter. This is first part of the duodenum. This is Second part of the duodenum where you are seeing a spurter. Okay, here they are using some uh, thermal methods, heat up probe or APC you can use and you can stop the bleeding. This bleeding you can you can stop. And here in this picture you are seeing they have applied a 
hemoclip to stop the bleeding. Yeah, that is what he was saying here. This is how you have to stop. Suppose if, if, if you are unable to stop the bleeding by all these endoscopic muscles, then because this is a case of bleeding duodenal ulcer, so you have to open the duodenum horizontally like this. Okay? And then you have to suture like it. Here, the artery involved is gastroduodenal artery that you have to suture like it so that the bleeding will stop. Then, uh, this uh, you have to, you, you have already opened the duodenum horizontally, but you have to close it vertically. This is what is called Henke Mikulis principle. You have to you have to op open it horizontally, but you have to close it vertically. Here also, even after this patient, along with this, if your patient is very uh, young, okay, you can do truncal vagotomy, and this is what is this is what is known as pyloroplasty. So you can. Along with this procedure, if the patient is very young and stable, you can also do a truncal vagotomy. Yeah, you, you can just read the answers. And case number four. 53-year-old man presents to the emergency room with painless, bright red bleeding from the rectum. Bleeding is described as large volume, massive, occurring three times in the preceding eight hours. He has never had a colonoscopy. He has no family history of colorectal cancer. On examination, BP is only 90-55 millimeters of mercury. Pulse rate is 120. Abdomen is normal. PR, no mass, but blood in the rectal vault. Okay, this is the uh, case scenario. And this is what you are seeing here is colonoscopy. In the colonoscopy, you are seeing bleeding from this diverticulum. So, this is a case of bleeding diverticulosis. This is also colonoscopy, but here the bleeding is profuse, so that uh, here you are not able to see the diverticulum from where the bleeding is happening. So, what is this diverticulum? What is the etiology? This is because of increased intraluminal pressure in the colon. It is commonly, it occurs in the sigmoid colon, okay, because of increased intraluminal pressure. And this occurs in the weak area. Weak area is where this vasa recta is penetrating this colon. And this is not a true diverticulum. This is a false diverticulum where only the mucosa is protruding out. Yeah, it is not the whole of the bowel, only the mucosa. Whereas Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum. That you have to know. What investigation is 1 and 2? Okay, I have told you. What is this figure 3? Here you are seeing... This is mesenteric angiogram, most probably a DSA. Here you are seeing the dye is getting extra vesated here. This is the site of the bleeding. Okay. This is mesenteric angiogram. And here you are seeing an another, yet another investigation to localize the site of the bleeding. This is called technetium 99 RBC tagged isotope scan. Yeah, the RBC will... Uh, tagged with technetium. Technetium 99 will be tagged with RBC and okay, wherever the RBC is going, okay, the technetium 99 also will go. You have to take a picture with gamma camera. You can see if the blood is going outside the blood vessel, the technetium also will go along with it uh, outside. Now, here you are seeing the extra vestation of this technetium along with the RBC. Bleeding you are seeing. So, even 0.1 ml bleeding per minute, you can <coughs> pick up by using this scan. Okay, this is what you have to remember. So, the best investigation is, of course, this technetium 99 scan. And how will you manage this patient? Okay. Diverticulosis bleeding is usually self-limiting in three days' time. If patient's hemoglobin drops less than 8 grams, you can transfuse with packed obesis. If bleeding continues beyond three days, okay, you can try organ plasma coagulation, heat up probe, or hemoclip. Normally, we won't do surgical intervention for bleeding diverticulosis. Case number five, this is a 83-year-old patient with known history of diabetic mellitus, hypertension, chronic renal failure, congestive heart failure, with a two-week history of crampy abdominal pain following meals with 
thin passing thin caliber stool but no nausea and vomiting but okay he is having bleeding fear okay hematochesia on examination vitals normal abdomen was non tender somewhat distended with a palpable mass in the left upper quadrant of his abdomen his rectal exam revealed goyab positive brown color stool so there is a mass in the left hypochondria number 1 and patient is passing thin caliber stool and he is having bleeding fever also so with this clinical picture you have to suspect tumor uh, malignancy in uh, colon or rectum but because there is a mass in the left hypochondrium you have to suspect a mass either in the splenic flexure or the descending colon this is the colonoscopic picture where you are seeing an ulcerative proliferative growth just below the splenic flexure the same thing you are seeing here partly this is occluding the lumen of this colon and what is this investigation this third picture this is ct colonography or also known as virtual colonoscopy you need not actually need a colonoscopic instrument to do it you can do the ordinary uh, ct of the abdomen and the computer will generate this picture okay you are seeing the same tumor here also computer will generate this picture inside this is the colon inside the colon you are seeing the tumor also virtual colonoscopy if patient is unfit to undergo actual colonoscopy you can do this procedure okay what is the investigation uh, you are seeing here and here so here in this picture it is cct cct contrast enhanced ct scan where you can see this is the bubble descending most probably descending colon you are seeing a thickened wall with a tumor there so this is a diagnostic and you can also see the liver any secondaries in the liver because the colonic or rectal carcinoma will the first uh, filter is the liver if if it spreads through the portal vein okay you can get secondaries in the liver that you can rule out and and you can rule out any uh, para aortic lymph nodes also you can rule out by Uh, i mean by doing the ct of the abdomen and this investigation is a barium enema where you are seeing a classical apple core appearance okay there are four types of colonic carcinoma one is the ulcerative type uh, the cauliflower type annular variety and tubular variety in tubular variety you will have this apple core type if it is a annular variety of uh, colonic cancer you will get what is called napkin ring appearance that is what you will have yeah what is the staging system for colorectal cancer there are three staging system one is duke staging uh, osla collar modified dukes or tnm staging so what is the tumor marker for colorectal cancer and its importance the tumor marker is cea this cea is not having any diagnostic significance but in the follow up or surveillance it is important to pick up early recurrence or metastasis that is the importance of ca just because some patient is having i mean elevated ca that doesn't mean patient is a case of uh, i mean uh, colorectal cancer what is the treatment you will do in this patient of treatment depends on the staging of this patient uh, in early cancer without distant metastasis radical extended right hemicolectomy should be done for splenic flexure growth in advanced cases we have to give only chemotherapy and there is no role of radiotherapy in adenocarcinoma anywhere in the world please keep it in mind because it is not radio sensitive adenocarcinoma there is no role of radiotherapy for the primary tumor if it is if there is secondary in the bone for the secondary in the bone you can give radiotherapy for pain relief not for the primary 